tonight. Ramadan dawns. Gaza marks the start of a somber holy season as Israeli forces tighten security around the surrounded West Bank. The world decries as the humanitarian crisis in the region continues. Russia decides. Early voting begins for Russia's elections in the newly annexed, formerly Ukrainian regions, with questions arising. Do the votes count? And is this a truly democratic process? New bonds. India says hello to its newest business partners, a free trade agreement with European nations that could potentially spell an economic boom for the populous nation. And it's a wrap. The 96th Academy Awards go out with a bang, with Oppenheimer at the helm. A melancholic and fitting curtain call to the stunning award season of the year. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and welcome to World News Tonight. We are very glad to have you tune in to kick off yet another productive week with us. And of course, we hope you have had nothing but a restful weekend and are ready to take on this coming week as well. Well, we here at World News have prepared an insightful lineup of what occurred across the globe over the past few days. And our updates, as always, start with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Well, Palestinians prepared for Ramadan in a very somber mood with heightened security measures by Israeli police and the specter of war and hunger in Gaza overshadowing the Muslim holy month as talks to secure a ceasefire have still stalled. Preparations are underway in Gaza's Rafah for a very different Ramadan this year. The Muslim fasting month is coming amid severe shortages of food and warnings of famine. Um, Sahib Abu Jabal now lives in a tented camp in the southern city. It is not like other years when the Ramadan table had different types of food. This year, God knows if we can find the food. Many people will be fasting and won't find food to break their fasting. Nevertheless, she said they were insisting on putting up decorations and celebrating. The latest conflict in Gaza began after thousands of Hamas fighters stormed into Israel on October 7th, killing some 1,200 people according to Israeli tallies. But Israel's relentless bombardment of the enclave has drawn increasing alarm across the world. The growing risk of famine is threatening to add to a death toll that has already, according to Gaza health authorities, passed 31,000. Efforts at securing a ceasefire have stalled. The conflict is also looming over the usually festive holy month in Jerusalem. Tens of thousands are expected every day at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, one of the holiest sites in Islam. The area, which is also sacred to Jews who know it as Temple Mount, is a long-standing flashpoint for trouble. Thousands of police have been deployed around the narrow streets of the old city, where the usual Ramadan decorations have not been put up. Israeli police say they've been working to ensure a peaceful Ramadan. Stall <laughs> owner Hisham al salami said people don't want to buy anything and no one is celebrating. This year, he says, there is no joy for Ramadan. And we're moving on to the crisis in Ukraine now. Some controversy has been stirred. As in an interview with Swiss media, Pope Francis said that in the face of defeat, Ukraine should consider sitting at a table with Russia to carry out peace talks and negotiate an end to the war, much to the distaste of Ukraine's Zelensky. The Vatican has issued an explanation for Pope Francis's comments in a recent interview with Swiss broadcaster RSI, where he suggested Kyiv should have the courage of the white flag and negotiate peace with Russia. The Vatican press team clarified the Pope was not calling for a surrender. Meanwhile, Russia's advancements around the Ukrainian city of Avdivka have lost momentum after several initial gains. Experts say the terrain does not favor offensive operations. Russian troops are exhausted by months of fighting and Ukraine has strongly committed to defending the area. 
Russia has continued its bombing of the Ukrainian city of Kherson. Late on Saturday, more explosions were heard. A five-story residential building was heavily damaged in a strike the night before, with two people killed and three, including a seven-year-old boy, were injured. And over on the opposing side, we have a democratic process that is underway as Russia launched early voting for the presidential election in the city of Donetsk in its controlled region in eastern Ukraine. Residents of Donetsk say they are glad that they became a part of Russia and are voting for Putin as they want peace and prosperity. For more on this story, we have other than a World News special correspondent Shanuka Damaratna from Vietbesk in Belarus. Shanuka? Yes, Anuradi. In December 2023, Russia's Central Election Commission announced the presidential election will include voting in the four regions of Ukraine that Russia claimed as its own territory last year. Ukraine has said that any Russian vote in the Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhye and Kherson regions will be null and void and that it will prosecute any observers sent to monitor voting. Moscow's ability to hold the election in what it calls its new territories is politically important for the Kremlin. But it raises logistical and security challenges because Russian troops only partly control the four regions. The areas controlled by Moscow have been placed under the martial law. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Shanika Damaratna from Vietbesk in Belarus. Well, now to the area where the axis of resistance concentrates. The U.S. military said that U.S., French and British forces downed dozens of drones after Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthis targeted bulk carrier Propel Fortune and U.S. destroyers in the region. U.K. Defense Minister Grant Shapps handed out this footage Saturday, which he said shows a Royal Navy warship shooting down a Houthi drone over the Red Sea. It was one of more than 30 drones that British, U.S. and French forces said they downed overnight and on Saturday. Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthis targeted bulk carrier Propel Fortune and U.S. destroyers in the region. The Houthis have been attacking ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden since November in what they say is a campaign of solidarity with Palestinians during Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza. The group's military spokesman, Yahya Saraya, said in a televised speech on Saturday, it carried out two specific military operations in this latest attack which achieved their goals. Al-Ula! The first operation targeted the American ship Propel Fortune in the Gulf of Aden with a number of suitable naval missiles. While the second operation targeted a number of American war destroyers at the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden with 37 drones. The U.S. military said no U.S. or coalition Navy vessels were damaged in the attack and there were also no reports by commercial ships of damage. That wasn't the case Wednesday when the U.S. military said a Houthi missile attack on a Red Sea merchant ship left several people dead in the first fatalities reported since the Houthis began these strikes. The Houthi military spokesperson said the group will continue the attacks until the aggression stops and the siege on the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip is lifted. And we have weather woes in our region of Asia tonight. Days of torrential rain have brought floods and landslides in Indonesia's province of West Sumatra, forcing the evacuation of more than 70,000 people while killing at least 19, with many going missing as well. Roads ripped apart and villages engulfed in water or mud. Days of torrential rain on the island of Sumatra are taking their toll on the population. Tons of mud, rocks and uprooted trees came rolling down on Friday night into a river that burst its bank and tore through mountainside villages like this one. Tens of thousands have been forced to evacuate and as the death toll climbs, search and rescue teams are scrambling to find those still missing. The joint team was expanded in the south coast area to 14 affected areas. Officials say relief efforts were hampered by power outages and blocked roads, covered in thick mud and debris. Located on the Indonesian island just northeast of Java, where Sumatra is particularly prone to natural disasters. Its steep terrain means landslides are common, particularly during the rainy season. And the phenomenon is made worse by deforestation, since trees play a vital role in the absorption of water. 
An unlikely day of remembrance occurred in India just last night as hundreds of Tibetans in exile marched on the streets of New Delhi to commemorate the 65th Tibetan National Uprising Day against China. Over 300 protesters gathered near India's Parliament House and chanted slogans including Tibet was never a part of China and China should leave Tibet. Now to India, where exiled in Tibetans residing in the country took to the streets on Sunday to protest against Chinese occupancy of their homeland. Large crowds of protesters gathered in New Delhi and in the northern town of Dharamsala to commemorate National Tibetan Uprising Day on March 10th. Protesters were seen marching with flags, banners and slogans with raised voices against the Chinese oppression. One protester said they were demonstrating in India because Tibetans in Tibet cannot, while another dragged a poster of Chinese President Xi Jinping through the streets tied to his vehicle. This year also marks 65 years since the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, was exiled from Tibet. China has ruled Tibet since its army invaded the region in 1950. Well, we're still in India as the country has signed a free trade agreement with a group of four European countries that are not members of the European Union. The deal with the European Free Trade Association will see investments in India of $100 billion. This is according to India's trade minister. The EFTA is made up of Norway, Switzerland, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said in a statement that this landmark pact underlines their commitment to boosting economic progress and creating opportunities for their youth. He added that the times ahead will bring more prosperity and mutual growth as they strengthen their bonds with the EFTA nations. The agreement comes after almost 16 years of negotiations. Under this deal, India will lift most important tariffs on industrial goods from the four countries in return for investments over 15 years. The investments are expected to be made across a range of industries, including pharmaceuticals, machinery and manufacturing. The EFTA said in a statement that the agreement enhances market access and simplifies custom procedures, making it easier for the India and EFTA businesses to expand their operations in the respective markets. In the end, the four EFTA nations now need to ratify the agreement before it can take effect, with Switzerland planning to do so by next year. And on the road to the White House tonight, the fight continues. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump both held campaign events in Georgia with Biden visiting Atlanta and Trump holding a rally 70 miles away in Rome. The events come on the heels of Biden's State of the Union speech and his campaign releasing a new ad tackling the issue of his age in stride. Tonight, the first dueling rallies for the presidency in battleground Georgia. President Biden landing in Atlanta with former President Donald Trump 70 miles away in Rome, his first time in the state since being booked at the Fulton County Jail last August, accused of scheming to overturn the 2020 election. Hello, Georgia. I'm thrilled to be back in Rome. We did very well in Rome. President Biden's Georgia visit coming on the heels of a State of the Union speech supporters hailed as energetic and fiery. That walk back drawing fire from Trump, who met with the parents of Lake and Riley before his rally. And Biden should be apologizing for apologizing to this killer. Biden launched his general election campaign in Pennsylvania on Friday before turning his attention to Georgia and communities of color, getting key endorsements from Asian, black and Latino PACs, along with a $30 million commitment to help him win in November. The Biden campaign also releasing a new ad targeting communities of color and young voters in battleground states, taking the issue of his age in stride. Look, I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here in Atlanta... Are you registered to vote? Yes. Even as groups like this sorority work to register people for the fall election, the crisis in Gaza fueling a Biden protest vote for Georgia's March 12th primary. Still, President Biden buoyed by his speech to Congress that campaign officials say helped generate record single-day donations. Let's go in for a short commercial break, and when we are back, we have for you all you need to know about what went down at the Oscars last night. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 